at today's prices, we can purchase a studio in the 1970s would have cost six or seven hundred thousand dollars. All the capabilities of it, and it goes on a laptop. There was a lot of capital that was involved in the recording business uh, up until computing took over. People say, you know, how do you sell a million records? And I say to them, meet a million people. Staging, props, prepping, uh, post-production, sound effect design, and music uh, composition. I needed a course in music theory, and I found a course that intrigued me. The title of the course was The Analysis of Music by Computer. Uh, I didn't know what a computer was. I didn't know who was teaching the course. Well, you know, the recording process from when I started was all analog tape. At that point, it was 16 tracks availability, then 24 tracks became available. Um, the two-inch size tape was rather heavy, and during an album project, you might have 10 to 25 reels of tape and one or two songs per reel of tape. So you'd constantly be loading them up, transferring, recording. And if you needed to edit, at that point, you'd have to do your edits on the machine using grease pencils and rocking the tape and or cutting out with razors uh, physical holes inside the tape. In a very major way, it used to be that in order to get your hands on the equipment, which was very expensive, uh, typically a, a two-channel tape recorder would be the equivalent of six months of a decent wage. So by the time they let you put your hands on it, you were pretty good at it. I know what the Beatles were using in the 1960s. Uh, they had all the resources available to them. They could have done whatever they wanted, and they couldn't have done what we do today routinely at any price. So it's made my life and majority of everybody else's lives a lot more focused on the creation of the content rather than the manipulation of older technology um, really does give you the capability of increased speed. However, with that capability, you tend to do more things, so it's really not a time saver at all. And all of a sudden, with the advent of digital, it either worked or it didn't, so the maintenance was pretty minimal, and it worked most of the time. Um, because you could do multiple channels, record sound source that is close to the sound, so you didn't care for the most part what room you were in. It goes on the same computer that you use for your email and uh, your web server. You're producing the music, you're creating the music, you're uh, doing the post-production, you're distributing it, uh, and it all happens while you're in your, your pajamas. It comes down to the point where you can create on your desktop and everything that you've created there can be utilized in pretty much any studio, uh, regardless of quality and regardless of location. So if I'm working on a piece for somebody in London, it's easy for me to communicate with them almost instantaneously and let them hear what I'm working on, maybe even collaborate some parts back and forth. Um, and it just happens so fast, it's easy and really fulfillingly fun uh, to integrate uh, what we have today in technology. It's, it's truly um, the composer slash is taking the recording process from the engineering and sort of becoming their own hybrid technology engineer composer. just read an article yesterday. Um, uh, Pachyderm Studios in Minneapolis, uh, one of the big studios. Uh, Nirvana had worked up there. PJ Harvey had worked up there. Um, Steve Albini from Chicago, Electrical Recording, had, had gone up there and done some records. But I mean, they had a string of hits in the 90s. And this is a studio that is, they've got two rooms. One of them, they've got a large Neve console in, which apparently is, is on the fritz right now. Um, their heating bills, because it's a live-in facility where a band can go and, and record and work, the heating bills for the facility apparently are close to 10 grand a month. The studio used to get 1700 a day for studio time. 
They can't even get 600 a day now. And they are essentially very close to just closing the doors because it's not a profitable business. Think about it. You have 64 channel Reaper software that any knucklehead can have in their house, which is free. They can download the software for free with 600 plugins for free. Or they can spend $1,700 a day at Pachyderm Studios using a Neve console. Enormously, enormously, because when you can buy for, let's say a Pro Tools system will cost you $600, and it's pretty darn good, you're not willing to go out and spend $400 an hour for a studio. Now granted, you get a very well-trained engineer, you get a big board, you get a beautiful sounding big space, all of which is terribly expensive to do. The big consoles are a quarter million bucks, and uh, the engineer is going to be making fifty, sixty thousand dollars a year, and the rent, if you're in New York or Los Angeles, is going to be horrific on the, the size of the studio. So these four hundred and five hundred dollar an hour studios are not making a lot of money doing that, and because they're not bringing in the same volume of business, a lot of them have gone out of business. They have been able to make the knock. What the professional recording studios have to offer is their expertise, uh, very fine microphones, and an environment for uh, acoustic recording. That's not going to go away. The best musicians will need the best facilities, and the recording studios will do that. But the recording studios now have to be computer experts. The recording engineers really need to know a technology uh, that didn't exist in the studio 20 years ago. Uh, the, best, uh, the best recording engineers have embraced all of that and they've become uh, just as fluent in the computer world as they were in the audio tape world. The industry has been affected dramatically on home studios, um, being able to be self-contained content creators. Um, the big mega studio, uh, which would have literally millions of dollars invested and charge hundreds of dollars per hour to be utilized, um, has really felt the pinch.